Hi, everybody. This is Doug Nelson, the founder of Precision Neuromuscular Therapy. And in this video, I'd like to go over some of the anatomy that you will be presented with in Precision Neuromuscular Therapy for the hip and thigh. If possible, it's good just to uh, review some of the anatomy resources before you go into class. It'll make the class uh, go much more smoothly and I think you'll get much more out of the class if you, if you have the chance to do just a little prep. If you don't, don't worry about it uh, because we'll spend a fair amount of time with the anatomy at a seminar. One reason to do that is, as you know, in the seminar we talk a lot about artistry. The goal is to master the basics, to master the fundamentals so well that we can move from being a technician to an artist. That's the goal of everything. That's what we're trying to do. And I think it will make the experience richer and deeper for you. And there's no other way to go about this other than working on those things. And in all the years that I've spent with the highest level of athletes and performers of any kind, they master the science to get to the art. So we'll do the same. One of the concepts that I think is very important, you know, from the beginning, especially when we look at the hip, is this idea of mobility and stability. Meaning that when you look at the body, your ankles are incredibly mobile. Your knee kind of fore and aft. I mean, that's what the motion cap uh, capacity is. Your hips are incredibly mobile. Your low back, not so much your mid-back, very mobile, your upper thoracics and lower cervicals, quite stable, and your upper cervicals, of course, incredibly mobile. Here's the thing. If you lose mobility in one of the areas that should have it, then you have to make up for it somewhere else. And boy, nowhere is that more true than in the hip itself. If you lose the movement capacity of your hip, you'll try to make that up oftentimes in the low back, and that will be disastrous. This is the really interesting thing, that what happens is for the um, hip and low back that your um, the symptoms often will show up in the low back, not necessarily in the hip itself. So the real reason to treat somebody's hips may not be hip pain, but might be low back pain. That's quite common. And there are a, n a number of studies that show this. Here's one of them. Uh, this was a, a study from 2015, 30 su healthy subjects without um, nonspecific chronic low back pain. That's what those at, uh, letters mean. Um, showed much more um, uh, restriction in hip range of motion than people who didn't have low back pain. There are many studies showing the same thing. And when you take the golf seminar, you'll see how that really, really plays out. Look at the list of muscular causes of, of hip pain. It's a long list. The thing is, when someone comes in with hip pain, you can't work all of these things because now your session's really inefficient. You have to be able to, um, in a way, triage through this thing and mostly with cognitive and quick assessment concepts, work your way through and rule out of all of this list. No, I think it's most likely one of these three and then rule out from three to two and hopefully two to one. So it's all about confirming and disconfirming who the possible causes are. So to that effect, one of the things that you'll do in the seminar is go through internal rotation, external rotation, um, extension and flexion and do this in both uh, the supine and prone positions. Muscularly, um, good idea to review just the anatomy of the gluteus maximus again. Um, notice its superior attachments um, to the kind of long dorsal ligaments and the side of the sacrum and also how it feeds in to the iliotibial band, which makes it a very important player potentially in iliotibial band um, discomfort. The medius, oh my goodness, you're gonna spend some time with this and I think you're gonna love the flexible approaches that we will use to treat this. Again, notice the architecture of this muscle and, and both on the superior aspect, but also familiarize yourself with where it attaches on the trochanteric head. So I love this picture. This shows you where those attachments are look where the medius is, but also look where the minimus is anteriorly. 
uh, on the trochanteric head itself. So um, kind of lock that picture into your brain. And here's a cadaver dissection uh, looking, for instance, you can see the piriformis at the top and the uh, uh, down here you see the obturator externus. So um, the more you can familiarize yourself with the deep uh, intrinsic muscles of the hip, I think the easier that will be for you when we get there. Don't overlook, the, this is the long dorsal ligament and this is the sacrotuberous ligament. These are very interesting um, in terms of symptom presentation. We'll go over that in the seminar, but um, make sure you're at least aware of them and where they are and where their attachments are. Again, when we look at the deep hip rotators themselves, um, just kind of, again, uh, review the anatomy, whatever textbooks you have, but kind of lock this in your brain in terms of where the medius is, piriformis, the obturators, the gamelli, and, and uh, this forgotten muscle who has a really terrible marketing director, and that is the quadratus femoris, because it is actually bigger than all of the other muscles of uh, deep hip rotators, and, and it's the most inferior, and yet uh, often overlooked as a source of pain and problems. Um, piriformis, you know, uh, it's a relationship to the nerve, it's attachment on the anterior part of the sacrum, and it's attachment on the trochanteric head. Make sure you're aware of those things. Um, what's very interesting about the obturator is that as the piriformis and the quadratus femoris move the femur, the obturator actually moves the pelvis on the femur. So it is a, a bit different than any of the other, quote, deep hip rotators. It really doesn't move the femur, it moves the hip. This is very similar, if you remember, to the iliacus and the psoas. And then here's a picture of the TFL, tensor fascia lana, and how it really feeds into the ITB, the iliotibial band. So you can see the way the, the maximus, the medius, and the TFL are all feeding into what becomes the ITB. So very important uh, player in that way. And, uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time with the hamstrings as well. We kind of do some of the, hams the upper hamstring issues with the hip seminar. We'll do more of the lower hamstring issues with the um, leg and feet uh, seminar. But the membranosus, tendinosus, and the bicep femoris. One interesting note about the bicep femoris is in about half the population, this interdigitates with the sacrotuberous ligament. So instead of its total attachment being on the ischial tuberosity, it actually feeds into the um, sacrotuberous ligament. So when someone says, when my hamstring is tight, then my low back will act up following, you know, maybe your client is one of those people. So for instance, how this translates clinically is if your person presents with sacrotuberous ligament uh, sensitivity, maybe that sensitivity is coming from the hamstring and, uh, and that's where you need to be treating. So, and, and last but not least, just familiarize yourself with uh, adductors. We won't spend a lot of time with this in the seminar, but if there's one adductor to focus on, it is definitely the adductor magnus, which in many ways is the fourth hamstring, both functionally and in symptom presentation. So, uh, and again, when we're talking about adductors, just always be aware of and be able to locate through palpation the femoral artery. All right, so I hope this helps. Um, it's all, if you can be a little bit prepared before you go into the seminar, it's always great. And we appreciate you taking the uh, PNMT for the hip and thigh. And just that you're there says something about who you are as a therapist and that you are dedicated to lifelong learning. And that's the most important thing and it will serve your clients well. Thank you so much for the good work that you do.